So in this video, I'm going to do a demonstration of me painting this painting here. This is the finished painting. And I uh, went ahead and pre-mixed some colors. Um, normally, if I was going to do a landscape like this, I would not pre-mix all these colors. But I thought that I would do it this way because this is how I would teach my students to paint a sky like this. And um, I usually don't uh, paint landscapes uh, from photographs um, where I'm just, you know, basically trying to paint what I see. Um, you know, I did one before where I made one up uh, out of my imagination completely. I've done some where I had a source, but then I took a lot of liberties to just do whatever I wanted to do. And that's usually what I do with landscapes, is just kind of do my own thing. And in this one, um, I just liked it, and I thought, well, it would make a good uh, YouTube video where you're doing a landscape and you're actually trying to paint basically exactly what you see, which is what I almost never do with landscapes. But I did like this one, and um, I thought it deserved uh, to be painted. Um, believe it or not, I took this... Um, with my um, cell phone, which has a really nice camera. Um, and a picture like this normally would not, if you tried to take this with an old fashioned camera, like a film camera or even an old, old digital camera, um, you would have, the foreground would have come out completely in a silhouette of black pretty much against that sky. In other words, if you expose properly for the sky, like this has been. Nothing's blown out in the sky. You don't see any white, white areas. Um, but the foreground would be completely a silhouette of black if you exposed properly for that sky. And the reason you can see the foreground is because the artificial intelligence in my phone has basically made a really beautiful high, dynam high dynamic range photograph. And, um, you know, I don't think I could have done as nice of a job you know, with this in Photoshop, it would have taken me, oh, I don't know, I don't think I ever could have done it. So I'm really taking advantage of, uh, you know, the artificial intelligence ability to take a landscape like this and bring up the foreground, foreground properly, um, you know, and, and, and making it still look like it all works. So the foreground is dark, but it's not black. So I'm just filling in here, and I usually work um, dark to light. Um, in the foreground, I did work pretty much dark to light, painting in my blacks first, and then um, finishing with the lightest parts of the foreground. And that's the way I normally teach to paint. I highly recommend painting that way, working dark to light, because you can see the form of things um, for instance, if you're painting a vase, you can see the shape of the vase very, very early on. If you're doing a portrait, you can see a person's likeness very early on if you work dark to light in a strict way, meaning painting all the blacks first and then the next step first and the next step. And that's kind of how I did the foreground in this painting. But skies are different because skies, um, for one, they tend to be very bright and um, on the, you know, very much the light half of the of the value spectrum. And so therefore, um, when you paint a shadow, like for instance, this part that I'm painting in now is that part that, you know, touches the, 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 uh, the horizon there. And that's in the sky, that looks like a shadow. But in my painting, it looks like, you know, a highlight, so to speak, because my stain color is actually darker. Than this, uh, than this cloud. So in other words, it's sort of confusing because if you're, when you're painting a sky, you might paint the shadow of a cloud, but it looks like the highlight of a cloud on this background. So I take a lot more liberties with the order in which I put things in when I paint skies. I just kind of do it however I feel like it. Um, but um, still try to sort of work dark to lights, but you just kind of get lost because skies are just all over the map. 
as far as values go. And you're not painting a three-dimensional form. You're painting this light that's coming through the clouds. So it's a whole different thing. Um, and uh, that's why I'm not really uh, following that rule here in the sky. I'm just kind of jumping around and putting things in and just kind of moving generally from um, the horizon up. Now one of the things you'll notice when I paint this is that I don't blend. I mean, there's going to be some blending or maybe it, maybe some of it is blending when you see my brush move you know, horizontally back and forth or whatever. But I'm really trying to keep my colors separate. And I do that always. And that's such a um, key thing, at least for me, when I'm painting landscapes. You know, it's like you're putting in little patches of color. And you don't want to blend all those colors together. You want to keep those colors separated out so that the orange parts don't mix with the purple parts. And by just blending it all together, it, it really loses that effect. You know, it wouldn't take but just a couple strokes to lose the intensity of the orange there in the middle. Um, so you'll notice that I try to maintain texture on the sky. Um, there are some bits that, you know, sort of look as if they're getting blended, and certainly they are because it's wet paint into wet paint, which naturally blends all the time. But I'm really making an effort always to sort of keep my colors separated out and to keep a little bit of texture on the surface. So here's an example. Those clouds that I'm putting in, they look like light parts in the sky, but those are actually the dark clouds coming across the, the light. And so that's why I went in ahead and put in the light parts like I'm doing now. So that you can kind of, so that I, as I'm painting it, can have a, a better uh, reference. So even though I pre-mix these colors, I'm always playing with my color, and you'll see that throughout. Um, one of the, you know, in, in general, speaking about the color in this painting, is you always, it's always better to have a dirty base and then to come in with the intense colors at the end. So I'm sort of holding off on putting in those really intense oranges until the end. And then I can come in with the strongest, you know, strong, a really nice strong orange. And when I lay it on top of those dirty colors, it looks wonderful. As opposed to looking at an orangey sky and just trying to go for it right from the very beginning and amping up all your oranges. Um, also, you know, you got to be careful not to uh, overset work from photographs where the colors have been oversaturated, which is something very typical, especially when you're talking about skies like this with a lot of color. Um, it's very, very common for people to uh, make the colors more vivid. Sometimes the software in the camera will do it. Uh, certainly cell phones amp up color a lot. But I like to work from color that is, it, I mean, there is intense color in the photograph and the source that I'm working from, as you can see. But the vast majority of that sky is very dirty colors, very neutral colors. I mean, you can look at them on my palette and see that they're not very strong. And it's real easy at the end, you know, to mix up some intense orange and put it where it goes. And when you do that, it really, you know, that's where you really get those beautiful colors is to start with those dirty colors first. Just laying in the colors slowly, again, trying to keep them separate. Um, you know, I always think that landscapes are... That, that the hardest thing about landscape is getting a good source material. And that's, there's just no easy way to do that. I mean, it's easy to get online and search for landscape photography and find, find some nice stuff. But if you want to um, get your own source material, um, 
there's just no easy way to do it except to get out there um, in the golden hours, which is you know early in the morning or in the afternoon, late afternoon, um, and take a lot of photographs if you're going to work from uh, source source photographs. If you're going to work from life, then that's plain air, and there's, that's a whole nother, uh, you know, um, level of difficulty in terms of, you know, the skies change. I mean, trying to get out here and set up to do this one would have been completely impractical, um, you know, on the side of the interstate. <laughs> so, you know, I think that um, even in the early days when uh, the guys, you know, from the Hudson River School, were painting, um, you know, landscapes and, and black and white photography came on the scene. They were running around with those with their silver plates on the back of their mules, you know, looking for um, landscapes, going out west and coming back with with uh, source material that way. So there's a long tradition of using photography to. You know, at least to to get skylines and and uh, the topography correct. I don't know if you'd call it topography, but you know the line of the mountain against the sky or whatever it is that identifies a certain place. A lot of times they'd go out, for instance, out to Yosemite or or wherever, and they'd get a get a skyline and then take it back east and uh, painted in their studio with the New England woods in the foreground. But as long as the skyline was right, everybody knew that was Yosemite, or at least was supposed to be. So this is my Virginia sky. Blue Ridge Mountains. Done a lot of backpacking in those mountains. This um, stain color that I work on, um, I love because it it works with everything, and it'll you'll notice uh, here and there that I'll allow it to uh, come through the canvas, and um, it just tends to work with all colors and that you know makes sense because it's a neutral color but um, you know I don't like stains that have a shift in in any direction because that will influence sort of how I end up painting it or how or how I perceive my colors so now I'm mixing up some nice uh, strong oranges and um, again I'm still holding off you know in fact I think in the end I decided to reduce some of the intensity of that color. Um, I don't know why, I've got a little bit more of a purple, some purples in there, and the purples and the yellows are complementary colors, and um, that's just something I love, you know, the, the yellow in the sky, and then the purples or the blues and the oranges. Um, so whenever you have complementary colors like that, you don't need to go extreme with your colors because the complement takes care of that. I mean, you can say this is very, very colorful, but it's just because, not because the colors are intense, but because they're simply opposites. You know, blue being the opposite of orange, um, purple being the opposite of the yellow. It's very not a very strong purple, but it's there. It's a color um, scheme that I learned from John Singer Sargent, and that is I just noticed it in his paintings when I started doing it myself. Um, not always intentionally, and you don't see it in all of his paintings, but that is you have a strong complement with a dirty, um, or, or rather a strong color with a dirty complement. So for instance, a strong red with a dirty green and uh, you know if you, th if you think about a red rose um, being a very strong you know 
that blood red. And if you take a rose and you put it on a different, you know, like a bright green leaves instead of the drab olive leaves that um, rose bushes have, that red would not be as beautiful, at least not to me. It's the dirty olive green leaves that make that red so pretty. So notice that I'm keeping my spots. I'm trying to maintain the abstraction as I paint, which is something I talk about a lot. It's, it's um, very natural for human beings, I guess. Everybody seems to do it to put more, or, more uh, order than is really there, so, or more of a pattern than is really there. So, and it's so easy to do. And this is a, a you know, way of brushing or moving my brush that I've developed over years where I sort of try to um, you know, avoid putting in a, a pattern that isn't there. Or um, you know, if, if you see all those spots, you know, that I'm putting in. It's very easy to just go spot, 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 you know, with equal spacing across, and pretty soon you have dots all over the place, and it's just, uh, so, never, or avoid the, um, the, it's almost a temptation to, to put in these patterns, or to, you know, when I used to paint fabric, I would, I would make it much more defined, and, um, bring order to the fabric that wasn't there and then that's what makes it look artificial. So I'm always thinking about that and you can see me doing that here in this sky. Keeping my colors separate, keeping a little bit of texture everywhere. You know, if you look at the uh, even in the top right corner of the sky, there's still a little bit of texture. You don't want to blend it all out. Even if you're painting a, you know, just a smooth, perfect sky, you still have just a hint of texture in there. It'd be very easy or very, um, it, would, it would be quick work to just blend this whole thing up and be done with it. But I'm, um, constantly, uh, you know, trying to keep the, the patchwork going, trying to keep my colors separate, even if they're slightly different in color. A little bit of gray, a little bit of blue, whatever it is. Always thinking about values. So as I put these colors in, I'm thinking about the values, I'm thinking about are my light splotches light enough? Are my dark splotches dark enough? And, uh, you know, you're not going to verbatim paint the clouds that you see over there. There's no way I'm going to paint spot for spot exactly the way I see it. That would take, you know, forever. I think I spent about maybe three hours on this painting in total. Um, and so I'm just painting a pattern that is similar to the pattern that I see. It's not exactly the same, but I'm always uh, maintaining the abstraction in my brushwork, um, avoiding blending, um, um, trying to keep my values correct. I did use, uh, did try to keep my values in check with this particular source photo. So as I was working, you know, I, I was checking my colors a little bit here and there. If you were painting from a laminated photo like this and you were happy with your photo, um, you know, you could check every stroke if you wanted to and really, um, you know, have a, have a sense of what the values are supposed to be. And when I say check your stroke, I mean put paint right on a laminated photo and you can see you can't do that off of a computer monitor. That's a whole different... Um, uh, that's a that's a completely different uh, situation. But that separation in color that you see, even in the in the top there with the blues and the 
and the purples or whatever it is, they're very slightly different in value and color. It's, it's hardly anything, but, I, but I'm going to always keep it separate. And that's the character of the clouds. not put in the bright parts that are going to go between the clouds. I'll do that at the end. So it's been a while since I've um, produced a video because I've been just as busy as I could be with uh, Geneva Fine Art and we had a real, um, our sales have really been taking off um, and so we were really swamped with not only paint sales, but easel sales and all kinds of stuff. So it's a good problem to have, but we were just one thing after another and was unable to uh, make videos for a while. But I'm back in the swing and I've got um, two or three that, sh that I'll be coming out with here soon. And uh, some real exciting uh, ideas that I have. Looking forward to uh, sharing with you guys. Our palettes will be back in stock at Geneva Fine Art. Finally, finally. I think they've been out for about a year. Finally found a good way to make them. So just putting in these pinks up here in the in the clouds, I don't, um, I think in the end, I don't know if I was really super happy with this uh, painting, but that's very typical for me. Not usually happy with my work. trying to keep it abstract. I also intentionally changed the shape of some of the clouds the, and kind of shifted things around a little bit, changed uh, some of the trees. Some of it was intentional, some of it not. So now at the very end is when I come in with the strongest oranges and um, lay them in on top. This is Geneva Fine Art paint that I'm using. Slow dry oil paint that is, um, doesn't have any toxic fumes, which I love. It's the paint that I make. We've been making it now for over five years. And we have some new colors coming out. And I'm really excited about, finally got our purple figured out. We've got a wonderful purple color that we should be producing very, very soon. As well as some other colors that I'm excited about. So just tweaking these little trees, you always got to think about scale. And if you notice, those trees look like massive, massive trees. And so I'm going to reduce uh, some of those long branches that reach way up into the sky. Um, scale is so important because if you're looking at that as if those trees are off in the distance, 
I've got to scale them down and make them smaller trees, which is what I'm doing. And you'll see now it looks much more realistic. And there's the finished painting. And thank you guys so much for watching. And uh, look for a new video coming from me soon in the next few weeks or so. And also, um, if you're interested in our paint, go check out Geneva Fine Art Supplies. It's GenevaFineArt.com, and you can find out more about our paint. And we'll see you in the next one.